Amen. The title of our subject, as you can see, is The Seven Trumpets. It is my firm belief, after having studied this book for many years, the more I look into the apocalyptic books of Daniel and Revelation, it appears to me that so often God will do things in the past and then he repeats them in the future. And with almost every apocalyptic event, wherein that process repeats itself, we call that type an antitype. As we launch into our subject here today on the trumpets, I believe that there was a type of the trumpets. But then in these last and final days, I believe it will be the antitype. Just as it was when Jesus proclaimed to the multitudes that there would be a type of the destruction of Jerusalem that would occur in A.D. 66 through A.D. 70. But then we are told by the prophet of the Lord that it has its greater fulfillment in our day. That means that what Jesus proclaimed to declare that what happened in his time was more or less a type. And what will happen in our time is an anti-type. Rome before, Rome now. And so as we launch into this, this is the premise by which I am coming. And I'm hoping that afterwards we'll have time for discussion or perhaps some questions. The seven trumpets are God's judgments poured out, and what's those two words? With mercy, with mercy. And the seven plagues or seven last plagues implicating the fact that there are seven first plagues and those seven first plagues are the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets, again, are God's judgments poured out with mercy. And God's seven last plagues are his judgments poured out without mercy. We know this because the trumpets come before the plagues. But not only that, as we see the trumpets unfolding, Oftentimes, we see that a third of the earth's inhabitants were destroyed, or the third of the trees, or the third of the rivers and water. Why? Because it's God's judgments mingled with mercy. And listen carefully to what I'm about to say. It is my firm belief that these judgments through the trumpets are primarily God's judgments upon the church. You will find that there are two schools of thought with regard to the trumpets. And oh, by the way, theologians are divided about the trumpets. Some believe, as we will find out here in a moment, that the trumpets specifically outline the details of the judgments that God renders toward Rome, Western and Eastern Rome, while others uh, disagree and say, no, the trumpets are specifically God's dealings with Jerusalem. So I do have some precedents here to, to be able to follow. But I happen to believe it's God's judgments upon the church. Why? Because the Bible says, to whom much is given, much is what? Required. God saves the final judgment of the seven last plagues, for Rome, we call that system Babylon. The revived papacy at the end, he waits. And, and it would only make sense because for those of us who have had a chance to repent, we are the ones to go out to the world to declare the message of the three angels under the unction and power of the Holy Spirit. And so we must be ready before all the world is because we have to carry the message. 
And so being ready now for the message, those who had an opportunity, those who should have been a part of that number, those who had sat in the pews Sabbath after Sabbath and listened to message after message and they only were playing church. The destruction of the trumpets will fall on them first. And, and those trumpets will be as an example to the rest of the world. You got to get ready because when probation closes for the whole world, then the seven last plagues fall upon the rest of the earth. And so notice carefully here, we know that the seven last plagues are God's uh, plagues poured out without mercy because we're told in Revelation, the 14th chapter, and there followed another angel. Uh, there followed another angel saying, if any man worship the beast in his image, and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall receive the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. What is that without mixture? That means without mercy. It's not mingled with any of God's mercy. Why? Because man has had plenty of God's mercy. And God is merciful to the very end until he sees that there is no more opportunity to win the hearts of the inhabitants. There is, no more, there is no more vacuum in the hearts of men to either receive or reject them. They have made their final decision, and therefore God must then now render judgment and justice upon the land. And so notice this, if you will. In last day events, servant of the Lord, validates this, that the trumpets, the judgments of God are his measures poured out with mercy upon those who should have, or, well, let me not, let me just read it. Notice this. The time of God's destructive judgments is the time of what? Mercy for those who now have no opportunity to learn what is true. Tenderly will the Lord look upon them. His heart of mercy is touched. His hand is still stretched out to save while the door uh, is closed to those who would not enter. Large numbers will be admitted who in these last days hear the truth for the first time. Does that make sense? Amen. So notice again, she says, the destructive what everyone? What's that next word? judgments will be mingled with mercy. But we know that the seven last plagues have no mercy mingled with them. Does that make sense? So let's just go through these seven trumpets as recorded in Revelation, the eighth chapter and verse 9, 10, and 11. The first angel blew his trumpet and hail and fire mixed with blood were thrown down on the earth. One third of the earth is set on fire. One third of the trees were burned and all the green grass was burned. Revelation 8, 8. And the second angel sounded it. And as it were, a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the sea became what everyone Became as blood. Revelation 8, 10, and the third angel sounded. And there fell a great star from heaven, burning as it were a lamp. And it fell upon the third part of the rivers and upon the fountains of water. And then notice carefully. Verse 11, and the name of the star is called Wormwood. And the third part of the waters became Wormwood. And many men died of the waters because they were made bitter. Revelation 8, 12, the fourth trumpet and the fourth angel sounded and the third part of the sun was smitten and a third part of the moon and a third part of the stars. So as the third part of them was darkened and the day shone not for a third part of it and the night likewise. And then notice carefully Revelation 8, 13. 
reveals to us that the next three plagues, trumpet plagues, are what are referred to as woes. Why? Because the first four plagues that fell upon the earth primarily had their targets upon the land and the sea. But the next three do a great work to then now reveal God's judgments upon the inhabitants. Notice that I beheld and heard an angel flying through the midst of heaven saying with a loud voice, woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants and inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels which are yet to sound. And then notice carefully, if you will, Revelation 9 and verse 3, where we see the fifth angel or the fifth trumpet. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, but that they should be tormented for how many months? Five months. Five months. And their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when he striketh a man. And the sixth angel sounded. And I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour, a day, and a month, and a year, for to slay the third part of men. Saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And then notice carefully, I'm sorry for this. Let me uh, let's look at verse 20 of Revelation, the ninth chapter. Notice carefully what the Bible says. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues yet repented not of the works of their hands that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and of brass and stone and of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor what, everyone? Nor walk. One of the primary interpretations whereby which we interpret the movements of the trumpets throughout history come from Uriah Smith. He is one of the leading proponents of which we have looked at the historicist view of the trumpets. And notice carefully, Uriah Smith's view of the trumpets outline a history of military onslaught. Notice this. It was the military history against Western and Eastern Rome. Starting from 395 to 419 during the Battle of Alaric. And then it goes on to 419 to 456 in the Battle of Genesaret of which it battled against, the battle was against the Vandals. And then notice 456 to 476, Attila, the Battle of the Huns, and Odiacer in 476 to 538. And then we get to the fifth trumpet, which, which outlines and characterizes the historic events of Islam. And notice carefully, it was the Othman rule from 1299 to 1449. And then notice carefully the Turks from 1449 to 1840. And finally, the West, where the new war order comes into play, 1840 to the time of Christ. Now notice this. To me, this is, or to the, to the time, yes, to the time of the Christian age. Now notice this. Uh, what we see in the seven trumpets, this historic view and outline takes us up to what was to believe to be the time of Christ, but as Adventist, 
what happened in our historic understanding is that we had believed that Christ would come in 1844. And so what many of the pioneers then did as they began to think about and assess the historic timeline, you had the likes of some who decided to say, wait a minute, should we reevaluate since Christ didn't come and we don't know how many years are still yet ahead of us, could it be that we need to reevaluate whether the trumpets are still yet future? And so here now we are in 18, uh, you know, the church had its great disappointment in 1844. Here now we are in the year 2019. Christ has still not returned. And when we look at that, I believe it was, I believe it was the spirit of the living God that moved on the pioneers to reassess and to maybe think about if, in fact, the trumpets still yet are forthcoming. Now, take a look at this. Here are the seven views of the trumpets held up by our primary theologians within our denomination. And as you can see, uh, for three of them, here is, uh, here is the theme of the trumpets with, its, uh, with Rome being the, the theme of it. Here's one. Uh, there is another here and another is that here. Three of them that outline the history of God's judgments upon Eastern and Western Rome, whereas the other four outline God's judgments through the trumpets upon his people, beginning with Jerusalem. Can they all be right? No. no. You know, so oftentimes people get critical when they say, I believe that the trumpets are future. When we have seven examples of of theologians who can't agree. So why can't I have a view that I believe from my basic own study that, that might be a good alternative? So notice this. Well, we'll go past that. Here it is. Josiah Litch. Aside from Uriah Smith, Josiah Litch was one of those pioneers who also lended his voice. And as you know, he was able to, in the sixth trumpet, able to accurately to the day pinpoint the time when the Ottoman Empire would be exposed. And notice most people are not aware of this, but this is what Josiah Litch said after the trumpets, after 1844 disappointment, after the failures of 1843 and 1844, he went back to the Bible to see where he went wrong. He found some answers that became and became convinced that the seven trumpets would be seven future events, including a meteoric firestorm that burns up a third of the earth and two civilization threatening uh, threatenings. In 1873, 35 years later, Dr. Litch published a book titled a Complete Harmony of Daniel and the Apocalypse, published by Cla uh, Claxton, Rim Rimson, and Heffinger, Philadelphia. He indicated that his previous view on the seven trumpets had been wrong. Most of us are not aware that he wrote this book. And uh, here is, it says, Litch concluded that the seven trumpets would take place just before the second coming, and he details that on page 155 to 158. Most people are not even aware that Litch changed his mind, his view on this. And I, I think as we go along that I have evidence that I would say is pretty convincing, but you have to study on your own to find if that's the case. So, are these seven trumpets past or future? And let me preface this. While I believe that the seven trumpets do have a past application. What word did I use? 
application. I believe it is primary interpretation is what? Future. Future. Now, notice carefully this statement we mentioned on our previous message, and we find this in 1 Corinthians, the 10th chapter in verse 11, that all these things happen to them, that is, the people of God, Israel, as in samples that are written for our admonition unto, the, unto whom the ends of the world are come. The events of Israel served as a type. And I believe that we're going to see that type demonstrated not only in modern times, but a type that we can find in Old Testament biblical times that is suitable and fitting for our understanding of the trumpets today. So what other evidence is there that the seven trumpets being future of the seven trumpets being future? Number one the golden censer. Number two, the first trumpet. Number three, Ellen White's comments. Number four, Revelation 9.20. Number five, judgment of the living. Number six, the great tribulation. And number seven, William Miller's rules of interpretation. I don't think we'll get through all of this, and we may have to do the second part in our next presentation, but we'll see how far we can make it. Okay, so let's look at the first the golden censer. Revelation 8, 3 says, and another angel came and stood at, and notice this, another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer, and there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Now, notice carefully in Hebrews, it gives us some identifying marks to help us know when the golden censer would be used. And after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all. So what day of the year are we referring to when the high priest would go into the most holy? The day of atonement. Notice this in verse five, four which had the golden what? Censer and the Ark of the Covenant. So question, when was the golden censer used? The Day of Atonement. What are the implications of that? That the trumpets, at the very least, would have to start after 1844 in the antitypical Day of Atonement. Why? Because this, this element that was used, or this artifact, or, uh, was used only on the Day of Atonement. Now watch this. Here's another reason. You may say it sounds simple, but I believe it's something worthy. I believe that God is more interested in warning people who are alive than dead people. Does that make sense? In Old Testament biblical times, when they blew the trumpet, it was to warn those who were alive. The dead didn't know the, the, the trumpets were blasting. So if we say that it happened before the judgment of the dead, it doesn't make a lot of sense if God is wrapping things up. And oh, by the way, what immediately follows after the seven trumpets are the seven last plagues. And as far as I know, the seven last plagues haven't fallen yet. So if it stopped back in 1700s or whatever, it would seem like there's a huge time lapse between then and now. Does that make sense? Number two, the contents of the first trumpet. Now, let me just say this. I believe that the trumpets are primarily physical rather than spiritual. They are physical. They're literal occurrences peppered with events that are, that are spiritual. Okay? We know, just like, for example, 
The seven last plagues are primarily physical. When the, when the sea turns to blood, right? And those kinds of things. But then we also know that there's some that are spiritual or symbolic. Like, for example, the fifth uh, plague where darkness comes over the seat of, of, the, uh, of the beast, right? Yeah, that's, we know that that is symbolic. And so I want to say that the trumpets are fi primarily physical, literal judgments sprinkled with, on occasions, a few that are spiritual or symbolic. So why do I say this? Notice this, if you will. The contents of the first trumpet. What must happen in order for the first trumpet to sound? Saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees till we have done what sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. Now, chapter seven is the sealing. The very next chapter is the trumpets. So if we say that the trumpets happen way in the time of Christ leading up to 1844, I don't believe that the seal of the 144,000 happened way back then. I could be wrong, but I don't think so. So what's happening, and here's the reason why. This all comes together when you begin to think about it and say, okay, why does he seal his people? Because if he's bringing destruction, he has a seal upon his people, which the angels can see. And then he begins to destroy those wayward who should have known better, the people of God who dilly-dallied around, who did not spend time in, with, with God in contrition, repenting of their sins. It's the picture that we have in, of Ezekiel, the ninth chapter, right? When we see the higher men at the gate, the six, the six men and one in the... In the, with the writer's ink horn, and he placed the mark upon the head, and the destruction began with the ancients. Is that right? And so it makes sense that the sealing has to occur, and this sealing, it occurs at the time of the judgment of the living, not the dead. Amen? Notice what Ellen White says. Powerful. I saw that God had children who do not see and keep the Sabbath. They have not rejected the light upon it. And at the commencement of the time of trouble, we were filled with the Holy Ghost as we went forth and proclaimed the Sabbath more fully. The commencement of that time of trouble here mentioned does not refer to those times when the plague shall begin to be poured out, but a short period just before they are poured out while Christ is in the sanctuary. And at that time, while the work of salvation is closing, trouble will be coming on the earth and nations will be angry, yet held in check so as not to prevent the work of the third angel. And that time, the latter rain or the refreshing from the presence of the Lord will come to give power to the loud cry of the third angel and prepare the saints to stand in the period when the seven last plagues shall be poured out. Now notice what she says. This is powerful. She talks about what I believe is a powerful description of the trumpets. She first says, solemn events before us are yet to transpire. Trumpet after trumpet is to be sounded. And then she says, vial after vial. The trumpets first, and then the seven last plagues. Trumpet after trumpet, and then plague after plague. And then notice carefully, this is the most powerful evidence, in my opinion. Notice what she says. Beautiful description of the first trumpet. Again, let me read the first trumpet. The first angel sounded, and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood, and they were cast upon the earth, and the third part of the trees was burnt up, and all the green grass was burnt up. So there you have it, hail mingled with fire. And let me just say this. I believe that this hail that comes, it has fire, 
And as a result, it brings much bloodshed. Therefore, hail mingled with fire. Now, you have a different point of view. I won't fight you against that. We're free to have differences of opinion. Amen. But notice what she says. Last Friday morning, just before I awake, a very impressive scene was presented before me. I seemed to awake from sleep, but was not in my home. From the window, I could behold a terrible conflagration. Great balls of fire were falling upon the houses, and from these balls, from these balls, fiery arrows were flying in every direction. It was impossible to check the fires that were kindled, and many places were being destroyed. The terror of the people was indescribable. After a time, I awoke and found myself at home. Now, in another place, and I wish I had put it on here, she says that those who had witnessed this event heard the sound of those who said, oh, we knew they would come, but not so soon. Now, wait a minute. If, if those were the seven last plagues, that certainly wouldn't be soon. By the time the earth gets to that place, there would have been wars, there would have been destruction, there would have been judgments, there would have been, nobody's going to say, boy, that came pretty soon. And so notice this, the description she gives are these great balls of fire. Now, you can look throughout all of the seven last plagues, and you will not find plagues mingled with fire. You do see hail, but you don't see those plagues of, of fire that come. The only place you find it is in the first trumpet. Revelation 8, 7, we just read that. Let's move on. All right. The next thing is Revelation 9, 20. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hand, that they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver and brass and stone of wood, which neither can see nor hear nor walk. And so notice this. The Bible refers to the seven trumpets as plagues, as what, everyone? Now, I believe that that is evidence because plagues are supernatural events. Are what, everyone? Supernatural events. You know, there are some people who think that maybe when these trumpet plagues begin to fall, that men will, will blame it on climate change. No. They're going to be of such a supernatural order. You know why? Because God has to make himself known that it is his judgments, that it's his judgments. And so I believe that these judgments that come are supernatural events that occur. And then now notice another evidence proving, I believe, that these trumpets are future is judgment of the living. Notice this, Revelation 11 and verse 1, And there was given me a reed like unto a rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God and the altar and them that worship therein. What is a rod symbolic of? There in Isaiah, the 11th chapter and verse 4, a rod is a symbol of the word of God. I'm sorry about the cut off there. A rod is a symbol of the word of God. So John here is taken up in vision. He sees this reed, a reed symbolizing again the word of God. He's asked to measure now the temple, the altar, and watch this now, them that do what? Worship therein. Question, do dead people worship? This cannot be the judgment of the dead. He's referring to those that are worshiping there at the altar. And oh, by the way, 
we know and understand that at the altar on the day of atonement, we find this in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, verses 5 through 7. We find and discover that, that on the day of atonement, the high priest would consecrate the altar of incense before going to the outer court. That's crucial for us to understand. And then notice carefully, he says, to measure the temple and they that worship therein. When you go to a tailor, he will measure you in order to fit you. Isn't that right? To fit you into an outfit. So here, John is told that the people of God will be measured by the word of God. The Bible says, so speak ye and do as they that shall be judged by the law of liberty. Our standard of judgment is the word of God. And so literally, God is told to measure his people to determine whether or not they are fit for the kingdom of heaven. Are they wearing the robes of Christ's righteousness? That's the only kind of clothes you can wear and make it into heaven. You can be dressed in Ciarucci. You can be dressed in Calvin Klein. It doesn't matter how clean you are. If you don't have on the righteousness of Yeshua, it's too bad. Isn't that right? And so notice this. At the time this occurs, the outpouring of the trumpets, is at the time of the judgment of the living. And here's what I find interesting, because I said to you on before that the trumpets were primarily God's judgment upon who? The righteous or the wicked? Or I should say God's people or the wicked, or those who were supposed to be God's people. Those who were supposed to be. Notice, but the court, which is without the temple, leave out and measure it not, for it is given unto the what? Gentiles. The last phase of the judgment in Leviticus, the 16th chapter, and in particular, verse 18 and 19, was when the high priest went to the outer court and he then anointed the brazen altar. Why? The brazen altar rep represents the Gentiles, the strangers that were among the children of Israel. The very last phase, God is so merciful. The very last phase of the judgment. And we're going to see literally in the next presentation, we're going to take you and literally point to you during the times of the trumpets each time that, that we find this unsealing taking place where God then judges at another phase, another group, until finally he reaches the place where he comes to judge the world. So notice this. He says, leave out the outer court. In other words, don't worry about them just yet. Because this focus is primarily on those who claim the name of Yeshua. Does that make sense? So notice this. We know that this is future based on what Sermon of the Lord says regarding chapter 11 of Revelation. Let all who would understand the meaning of these things read the 11th chapter of Revelation. Read every verse and learn the things that have not yet taken place. Is that what it says? I'm trying to catch you here. That are yet to take place in the city. Read also the scenes portrayed in the 18th chapter of the same book. Here she even tells us that these things are going to happen in the future. All right. This same judgment scene that we have looked at in Revelation 11 is also found with a different description in Zechariah, the third chapter. In Zechariah 3 and verse 1, and he showed me Joshua, the high priest. And oh, by the way, how many of you know that because the people of God called the 144,000, perfectly reproduce the character of Christ, they are not just priests, but they are symbolic of the high priest. Oh, wait a minute, pastor. Listen to this. 
The last church of the book of Revelation is the Laodicean church, and the promise that's given to those who overcome for the last church is that he that overcometh will I grant to sit in my throne even as I sat on my father's throne. What kind of person inherits a throne or sits on a throne? A king. A king. What kind of reward do those who make it through this, make it through this time of earth's history, what does God put on their head? A mitre. What kind of crown is worn by the high priest? A mitre. A mitre. Notice this. And the Lord said unto Satan, the Lord rebuke thee, O Satan, even the Lord that have chosen Jerusalem rebuke thee. Is not this a brand plucked out of the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and stood before the angel. And he answered and spake unto those that stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And unto him he said, Behold, I have caused thine iniquity to pass from thee, and I will clothe thee with a change of raiment. And then notice carefully, And I said, Let them set a fair mitre upon his head, so they set a fair mitre upon his head and clothed him with, a, with garments. And the angel of the Lord stood by and the angel of the Lord protested unto Joshua, saying. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, if thou wilt walk in my ways and if thou wilt keep my charge, then thou shalt also judge my house and shall also keep my courts. And I will give thee a place to walk among these that stand by notice what servant of the Lord says Zechariah's vision of Joshua and the angel applies with particular force to the experience of God's people in when the closing scenes of the great day of atonement the remnant church will then be brought into great trial and distress those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus will feel the ear of the dragon and his host Satan numbers the world as his subject he has gained control even of many professing Christians. But here is a little company who are resisting his supremacy. Somebody say hallelujah. If he could blot them out from the earth, his triumph would be complete. As he influenced the heathen nations to destroy Israel, so in the near future he will stir up the wicked powers of earth to destroy the people of God. Men will be required to render obedience to human edicts in violation of the divine law. And then let's look at the tribulation. Here's another reason why I believe the trumpets are future, because they happen right before the tribulation is poured out. Notice carefully, if you will, the great persecution. The events of the sixth and seventh trumpet are so severe during the sixth plague that one third of Earth's population is destroyed. Now, I want to show you this sequence so that you understand something about the trumpets. Most people think that they come just in sequential order, one through seven, and they do. However, there's a catch. Trumpets one through six occur, and the last trumpet itself trumpet number seven are consistent of the seven last plagues. So you have the six trumpets and the seventh one are the seven last plagues. And you say, wait a minute, Pastor. How, how can you say that? Well, notice this, if you will. Let's look at some proof. In Revelation 14, verse 19, it says, And the angel thrust in his sickle into the earth and gathered the vine of the earth and cast it into the great wine press." of the wrath of God. The great what, everyone? Wine. wine press. What is the wine press of God? It's found in Revelation 15, 1. I love that the Bible explains itself. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. So the wrath of God is the seven last plagues. If that makes sense, let me hear you say amen. So now notice this in Revelation 10, talking about the seventh trumpet. 
But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, he shall begin to sound the mystery of God should be finished as he declared his, uh, to his servants, the prophets. What occurs during this time when this seventh angel sounds its trumpet? Notice this, verse 3 of the selfsame chapter. And the angel of the Lord cried with a loud voice as when a what roareth? A lion roareth. And when he had cried, seven thunders uttered their voices. Now, what is this lion's roar that occurs when the seventh trumpet is sounded? Notice carefully, Jeremiah 25, 30. Therefore prophesy thou against them all these words and say unto them, the Lord shall roar from on high and utter his voice from his holy habitation, and he shall mightily roar upon his habitation. He shall give a shout as they that tread the grapes against all the inhabitants of the earth. Question, when is it that God treads the wine press? It's during the wrath of God. Question, what harvest, or I should say, what feast day points to the harvest of the grapes. Tabernacles. When is Christ coming? Uh, at least more widely accepted. When is Christ coming? Tabernacles. Right before Christ comes, what is he going to do the, to the inhabitants of the earth? He's going to pour out the seven last plagues. You follow me? The grapes are the wrath of God. We read that in Revelation, the 14th chapter. And here's other proof. The king's wrath is as the roaring lion. Now, we just read in Revelation 15, verse 1, that the wrath of God is revealed in the seven last plagues. And so here it says the king's wrath is as the roaring of the lion. In Revelation 10 and verse 3, it says during the time of the seventh angel, Christ would roar as a lion. And so that seventh angel, again, the first of the six trumpets flow, and then the last one, the seventh one, encompasses the seven last plagues when God pours out his wrath in full measure. Am I making sense? All right. Here's our biblical Old Testament example. When Jerusalem, or excuse me, when Jericho was conquered, they marched once every day for how long? Seven days around Jericho. Once on the first, second, third, fourth. But on the seventh day, how many times did they go around? Seven times. You see the pattern? The trumpets that are yet to come, there are six that follow. But then, guess what? The last of the seven are seven last plagues that go all out. That continue to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So Revelation 11, verse 7, and we shall see uh, when they shall have finished their testimony, the beast that ascendeth out of the bottomless pit shall make war against them and shall overcome and kill them. That is the large number of uh, the inhabitants of the earth who suffer death as a result. And notice carefully, you see, this is important because in the seventh in the sixth and the seventh trumpet is this huge bloodshed of a, over a third of Earth's inhabitants that are killed between the two. Notice this. The persecution by the Protestants, by Romanism, which the religion of Jesus Christ was almost annihilated, will be more than rivaled when Protestantism and popery are combined. Wow. She's literally saying that that which happened in the Dark Ages will pale in comparison to what Rome is going to do this time. And so now with, the, with this persecution still yet forthcoming that marks the sixth and seventh trumpet, the seventh trumpets would have to be future. Notice this. When this grand work is to take place in the battle prior to the last closing conflict, many will be imprisoned. Many will flee for their lives from city and towns, and many will be martyrs for Christ's sake and standing in defense of the truth. You will not be tempted above 
what you are able to bear. Jesus bore all this and far more. Would you say amen? Amen. Amen. I'm going to save this last one for our, for our next presentation. We've gone over time. But here's what I do want to do. I want to move forward and I want to do this. We talked on yesterday about how when Christ died on the cross, this word in Exodus 11, 1 for plagues is nege. And we find that when Christ died on the cross, he was stricken for our sins and afflicted. And we find that the word that's used for stricken is the same word nege. The marks that Jesus bore as a result of Rome's affliction the marks that came from that beastly power, the marks that were pierced into his skull from the crown of thorns, the marks that were pierced in his hands, the head and the hands, is what Christ received so that you and I would not have to suffer if we surrender our lives to him. Now, I want you to see how important it is for us to recognize what actually happened on the cross. That first plague, hail and fire, Jesus, he has the keys to death and hell. He was able to secure that when he died on the cross. That second trumpet, the mountain cast into the sea, Jesus says, if we forgive not our own brethren, it is like a mountain that intercedes between us and him. We find that in Mark 11. And verse 23 and 25, the star that turns to bitter water. Jesus was offered a bitter cup to drink on the cross. The fourth trumpet was the sun, moon and stars lose their light. We know, of course, that darkness fell upon the cross as he was dying. The fifth is Satan's sting of men. And we know that Jesus endured the sting of death when he died at the hands of the one who provoked death in this world. And then the sixth, the witnesses killed and the earthquake that happened. Christ dies and there was in fact an earthquake. The temple was exposed in Mark the 15th chapter and verse 38, the temple was exposed. You see what Yeshua went through for us? He gave himself and endured the wrath of Almighty God so that we would not have to be afflicted. He stepped in front of the car and took the brunt. He stepped in front of, in front of the sword and was run through. He stepped in front of pain and became our buffer. He stepped in front of anger and became our peace and our solace. He stepped in front of all that meant for our destruction. And instead of allowing us to get what we deserve, instead of allowing us to go through the turmoil, the pain, the tribulation, the hardship of writhing in pain, seeing the anguish of the second death, being able to experience that which separates man from God forever, Jesus allowed himself to be separated from his father so that we could be united with him. Who shall separate us from the love of God? Neither death, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Neither height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. Nothing shall separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. We have a savior who went to hell and came back so that he could hand you and me the keys to eternal life. Hallelujah to the Lamb. Praise his holy name. How many of you want to renew your sense of commitment to the one who took the plagues on your behalf? Amen and amen. Oh, Father, we thank you this afternoon for reminding us of what you did for us. 
We pray that our hands would be stayed in yours, that we might be able to escape what will take the world by an overwhelming surprise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs> well, praise the Lord.